everyone. How are you? Good. Excellent. Uh, my name is Maya Roy. I am from Canada. I am the CEO of YWCA Canada. So we're a women's NGO and we work with women and girls. Um, and one of the things that we do is we work with survivors of human trafficking and sexual exploitation. I would like to welcome all of you here today, both in our audience and also watching the live stream for our open forum on ending modern slavery. We have a very distinguished panel here with us this afternoon um, who I will be introducing shortly. So with us here we have Dr. James Cocaine. Um, he comes to us from the UN University where he works, uh, he's a director of policy research. We have uh, over here sitting uh, Sophie Otiende, who comes to us from a number of grassroots organizations based in Kenya. She is an advocate who does a lot of work on the ground, and she will be telling us a little bit about her work. Um, here we have Nina Shala. Um, she is a global shaper and also a professor of law. Uh, in, in Kosovo. And here, last but not least, we have Sir Wainwright, who comes to us from law enforcement. So welcome. I'll have actually each of you, uh, as we start, um, to tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your work. Um, one of the things that I think we're very much interested in exploring today as we're here in Davos um, is what does it mean for different stakeholders to actually address and end modern slavery. So when we're talking about modern slavery, there's different ways of defining it. And I'd very much like for each of our panelists to actually bring your individual expertise and what you've seen on the ground. What works? What, what doesn't work? Um, and what are some of the challenges and, and the solutions that you're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. Another thing that we'll be doing here today is actually exploring as an audience, what does collective action look like? How can we make change as community members, whether we're students, whether we're parents, and whether we are policymakers? So I think we're in for an exciting and dynamic 90 minutes. Uh, looking forward to having an open discussion. Uh, between the panel, and then we'll also have some time for audience questions and answers um, in in the last in the last half hour of the panel. So, does that sound good? Yes. Good. All yes. right. Um, one of the things that I wanted to to do is actually get the audience a little bit involved and actually talk a little bit about you know when we're talking about modern slavery, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, so the ILO. Uh, what they estimate, as we saw in the video earlier, that um, there's anywhere upwards of 40 million people on any given day who are either engaged in forced labor or who have experienced forced marriage. So to take us through some of those stats, um, I'd actually like for us to do a little bit of an exercise, and you're going to help me. So don't worry, it's very easy. All you have to do is stand up. So if I could please ask the audience to stand up. Nice. <laughs> if you can help me as well. Participate. Yes, thank you. Start I know, this is, I promise, this is, there's only two audience participation moments, but they're very, very easy. So we have um, four people here on the panel, and we have about eight to ten um, in each audience row. For every four people, I would like one person to sit down. So out of our panel here, I would like one person to sit down. Who needs the rest? <laughs> And how about over here? Can you sort of look amongst yourselves and see within every four people? Have one sit down. Good. I promise after this, there's no more math. <laughs> this is the last mathematical component. So thank you. So when we're talking about statistics, for people who are actually engaged in, in forced labor or forced marriage, uh, one in four of those people are actually children, so 25%. So keep that in mind um, as our panelists are talking about their, about their experiences. Um, I'd like everybody, whether you're sitting or standing, to put up both your hands and put your left hand behind your back. Thank you. So 50% 
of people in experiencing forced labor or marriage, 50% of them are experiencing debt bondage. So what is debt bondage? We're actually going to find out. I would now like all of the women in the audience to sit down. So just a little exercise to demonstrate. When we're talking about people actually experiencing this day to day and experiencing the impact uh, and the abuse of power, 70% of them are women and girls. So there's a very gendered aspect to this work um, that we're actually also going to be touching on. And you can also see how, how few people are still left standing from this huge audience here. And you can really get a sense of the scope of erasure um, that we see that happens with modern slavery. So when we're talking about modern slavery, one of the things I'd like for you to think about as an audience, it's very much about who has power, who doesn't have power, and if they don't have that power, who benefits from, from that power imbalance that our four panelists are, are going to be speaking about. So thank you very much uh, for bearing with me. Please have a seat. So I'm going to throw it over. Um, we talked a little bit about the st statistics. Uh, one of the things, Dr. Cocaine, that you have an expertise is, is around uh, mining big data and the importance of data to point us towards evidence-based solutions around addressing, um, addressing some of the issues we'll be talking about today. So over to you. Well, thank you, Maya, and thank you, everybody, for coming in and being here today. It's a pleasure to be here with such a distinguished panel and with all of you to talk about how we can all go about ending modern slavery and what, the role, what role we all have in, in achieving that. I'm so glad you started, Maya, with this exercise uh, of uh, giving people a sense of the scale of the problem and how it's distributed. So we saw a number at the beginning. The ILO, the International Labour Organization, estimates that there are about 40 million people in modern slavery worldwide. So that's about one in every 185 to 200 people. I think there are roughly 250, maybe 300 people watching in this hall and in, a, in an adjacent room. If you think about that, what that means and what we mean by modern slavery is that essentially we would treat one person or one and a half people out of all of you as though we owned you. So when everybody else leaves at the end of this lovely panel, whether that person left would depend on whoever is exploiting them, what that person said, for example. This is all about exploitation of vulnerable people. And I'm so glad, Maya, you started with this point about power. People may be vulnerable all over the world for a range of different reasons, and we'll have a look in a minute at what we know about who is vulnerable and why. But I just wanted to start with that number, one in 100 and every 185, if we think about the scale of the problem, that's pretty significant. Now, a few years ago, every country on Earth, 193 countries, agreed to take steps to try and bring that number to zero by the end of 2030. So just a little bit more mathematics. If we divide the 40 million by the number of days left between now and the end of 2030, it means we would need to reduce the number of people affected by 10,000 every single day between now and the end of 2030. So you're probably going to next ask me, you're thinking, well, OK, is that a big number? Is that a small number? How are we doing at the moment? I have the privilege of leading a project at the UN which tries to measure our progress towards that target. And we've been doing this for several years. And I can say with fairly high confidence, we're nowhere near that target of 10,000. So we need all collectively to think about how we can rapidly scale up our efforts to reduce that number uh, to a more manageable number or eventually to zero. So you might say to me, well, if the numbers are so big, where are these people, actually? Why don't we see them? And the, the answer there is that if we know where to look, modern slavery is actually so present in our world that it is visible from space. So what you see here is a satellite image of two brick kilns, one at the top, one at the bottom of the screen. These are giant ovens where people are held in debt bondage that Maya referred to 
which means that they may be being paid, but they're also, they've incurred a debt for the privilege of working in the awful, dusty, hot, dangerous conditions of carrying dirt and mud into a brick kiln and then staying there while it's baked into bricks. And this is quite prevalent still in South Asia, for example. So what researchers have begun to do is recognize this distinctive pattern of the brick kiln, what it looks like, and train artificial intelligence to trawl across satellite imagery and then map the results. Because if we, not every brick kiln is a site of debt bondage or modern slavery, but you're much more likely to be in debt bondage or modern slavery if you work on a brick kiln than if you work in many other work sites. So finding the brick kilns improves our ability to bring resources and help to the people who are enslaved in those workplaces. And that same technique, using artificial intelligence to examine uh, satellite imagery, is now being used to find sites of slavery in the Amazon, where illegal de deforestation leads to charcoal kilns. Those charcoal kilns make pig iron that is then used to make steel that goes, for example, into cars. So maybe some of the cars, when you go out, out the door, maybe they've been manufactured in part with slavery. The same technique has found slavery in the strawberry fields of Greece, where migrants from North Africa and the Middle East are being forced into labor uh, to pick strawberries for European consumer markets. That's the reality of our global markets today, that often right at the bottom of the supply chain or the value chain, there are people who are being forced to take risks, forced to labor in ways that they uh, otherwise wouldn't want to. So let's go back up to the macro level. Where is the biggest problem? Well, the best data we have is from the International Labor Organization, and you see it here. And you'll notice it's at a regional level, not at a country level, because the best data we have, the most rigorous that's available worldwide, gives us regional outcomes. Now, the highest rate of modern slavery is in Africa and Asia Pacific, uh, and that's why they're darkest. And by modern slavery here, we mean forced labor, including forced labor in the sex trade, but also in other trades, and forced marriage. If we take forced marriage out of the picture for a moment and focus only on the forced labor, that's what the bubbles represent. And you'll see there that the largest bubble is actually in the Asia Pacific. That's the picture for adults. What about for children, who Maya helpfully emphasized at the beginning? Well, this is the prevalence rate by region for children. 152 million children are in child labor worldwide, often in the same kinds of industries we talked about, or for example, in mining mica, the, the glitter that goes into glittery car paint, or indeed, perhaps into some of your cosmetics. Let's go back to bricks and mortar for a second. If I can get the video to work, what you're seeing here is a visualization of the growth of cities in the last few decades. You'll notice how much they grow, particularly in Asia Pacific. In China in the last 40 years, more people have moved to cities than live in cities in all of Europe. Now that rapid urbanization, of course, has a massive ecological footprint, but it also has a significant modern slavery footprint. Because urbanization means construction, and construction means demand for low-skilled workers, particularly men. So people are drawn to these jobs from the countryside or across borders, and as a result, they're very vulnerable along the way, vulnerable to corrupt officials who are forcing them to pay bribes to cross borders, corrupt labor brokers, and criminal employers. So construction is 13% of the global economy, but it's 18% of the world's modern slavery problem, by the best estimates. Now, urbanization is not all a bad story. If you move to a city, your life expectancy improves, in part because your income improves and probably your consumption improves. But in fact, consumption also leads to new modern slavery risks. Let's have a look at an example of this. 
So this is a visualization of the global trade in fish. The fish trade is worth about $1.4 billion worldwide. Every dot, every single dot in this visualization is $1 million of, of fish being traded. And you'll see again, that's grown a lot in the last few decades, in particular exports from the Asia Pacific. We now have about 4.6 million vessels fishing for us worldwide, fishing for us, and I would emphasize fishing for our cats and dogs, because often that fish, for example, goes into our pet food. Many of those people are fishing far away from the shore in very isolated, harsh and dangerous conditions. Many of them are migrants. So in agriculture and fishing worldwide, we see annually 1.8 million cases of forced labor and modern slavery. So if you're eating seafood tonight, or if you're feeding your, your animal pet food, just have a think about where that came from and whether it's slavery free. Another good example is the palm oil trade. Many of you may not have heard of palm oil, but it's actually very ubiquitous. It's a product used in everything these days from shampoo to chocolate, although I don't know if it makes its way into Swiss chocolate. We'd have to ask some locals. <laughs> the palm oil trade has also grown, you see here significantly in the last few decades. Palm is grown on plantations where often children are employed and where we see many indications of uh, modern slavery, debt bondage, forced labour. Indications such as people's passports being withheld so that they can't leave when they want to, or their wages being withheld. Concerns about these violations recently led Norway's sovereign wealth fund, its investment fund from the income it gets from petroleum and gas, which is the largest such in the world, it's worth one trillion US dollars, it divested from 33 palm oil companies because of concerns about this kind of violation. And also, uh, very soon after that, US banks followed suit and divested from many of those companies as well. So what we see here is that modern slavery is, in a sense, like climate change, a market failure. With climate change, we are not correctly pricing our production because we're not taking to, into account the effects of that carbon on our lives and on the economy in the long term. There's a lot of discussion of that here in Davos this week. Same story with modern slavery. We're not correctly pricing these labor practices. We think that, this, that the costs fall all on the people at the bottom end of our supply chains. Not true. Recent UK government research suggests the cost in the UK just to the public purse is 330,000 pounds, about $400,000, give or take. Just the direct costs, so looking after these people, prosecuting their exploiters, healthcare. We're not even talking about the loss to the economy from the fact that during their exploitation, these people aren't saving. They're not out on the high street purchasing jeans like you or me. They're not participating as active agents. So the true cost to all of us is actually quite big. The UK government thinks they have about 13,000 people in modern slavery in the UK. 330,000 pounds per person. Immediately you see, back to the maths, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> very big numbers involved here that we're not pricing into the way we organise our production, our consumption, our investment and our lending. And that's why we all need to be thinking about what our role is when we're buying the pet food, when we're putting our money in a pension fund, where is that money being invested? Are we unwittingly supporting practices that lead to modern slavery and human trafficking? Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Um, I find it really interesting because usually as economists, we, we tend to think of things in, in one or two variables, but what you're actually pointing out based on the data um, is we can't afford to not act. So as much as, yes, certain companies or consumers benefit from lower prices of goods um, fr from the so-called cost savings, you're actually pointing out that, that it's an expense we can't afford That's as right. a society. That's right. Yeah. We've heard a lot of talk here in Davos about 
What are the costs for business going to be if they have to deal with a carbon tax? What would the costs be if they had to, you know, really look down to the 13th or 14th tier of the supply chain and find these risky practices? That's the wrong question. The question we should be asking is, what price are we paying now and what price will we pay in the future if we don't make that investment to address these mm -hmm. issues before they arise? Wonderful, thank you. So in terms of uh, moving on in the theme of asking tough questions, um, I, I was very pleased to be able to speak with Sophie Otiende, um, who's done a lot of work as an advocate with HEART, which is Awareness Against Human Trafficking. Um, and she is also the incoming Africa Region Operations Manager for Liberty Shared. Um, Sophie, I, when I went on the HEART website yesterday, I was very impressed with the level of research and, and resources. Uh, and what really struck me was the toolkit that I saw around how to recognize uh, modern slavery and trafficking on the ground. In, in terms of your work and your experience, um, we started with the big picture, the, the global statistics. Um, what does it look like for you on the ground as an advocate? Uh, thank you so much, Maya. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dimth. Uh, it's always interesting to hear those numbers from like a big level and then to think about like at my level, those numbers actually mean faces. Mm -hmm. So when you say 40 million, I, I can recognize different faces that I can attach to different industries. So I think for me the most important thing, again, and I'm glad you spoke about like the cost. And for me, it's always as a survivor, as an advocate, it always breaks my heart when I hear that the only way we can get people to care is once we start thinking about the money. Mm. Like who's losing money, who's not, who's losing money, who's gaining money. And it just shows how much we don't care, for lack of a better word, how much we don't care about like the human element of this because people are suffering, lives are being lost. If you think about the trauma that people go through and we, there's the money that businesses, there's the money that government lose, but there's the pain of recovery, which those of us in frontline work have to constantly deal with. And I think for me, it's to think about, not just right now, but to think about also historically. The truth is, we live in a world which was built on people suffering. Mm. And we've sort of come up with a system where for us to get better things, there has to be a human cost, there has, there, there has to be people who pay a price. Mm. And it's people. Lives have to be lost so that other people, other people enjoy. And for me, that's so, it's so unfortunate because the ethics of this at a human level is so sad. Someone, a child in Africa has to die so that someone has a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. A child in Asia has to die so that you put on the next fancy dress. So for me, that's, that's sad. At a grassroots level, half the time when people talk again, talk about like survivors and talk about like uh, victims of trafficking, there's this othering where we see them as apart from us rather than one of us. And I'm glad that you actually did that exercise because the people that suffer, the people that pay the price are human beings. They have the same desires to wake up in the morning and just take care of their families. Mm. But what ends up happening is that someone is actually deceived and they end up in a situation that they are. For me, human we can't, we can't talk about, I can't emphasize that they, we've created an ecosystem that basically requires the blood of people to be shed for us to survive. So it's survival for the fittest. You are talking about power. It's a question of who's most powerful and they get to survive and the rest of everybody else gets to pay that price and literally pay that price, you know, die so that we can enjoy luxuries. Uh, I think uh, the, I, I like that we are moving towards 
like looking at evidence, looking at how we can fix this, especially using data and asking ourselves, how can I contribute? How can I make a, a difference? And all of us, for trafficking, for forced labor to, to end, all of us, the truth is, in most cases, you can tell people that this is not going to cost you a price. The truth is, this will cost us a price. All of us have to be a little bit less selfish for trafficking to end. There is no other way to do it. We have to be a bit less selfish than we've been operating for us to actually do it, to actually get ahead. It's an, again, trafficking doesn't exist independently of other issues. When you look at the places that uh, he's talking about, Africa, Southeast Asia, we all know some of the issues that are there. You're talking about gender-based, uh, places where gender-based violence is prevalent. So you can't fix human trafficking without thinking about issues like gender-based violence. 90% of the victims that I take, take care of, survivors that I take care of, are survivors of child sexual exploitation and are survivors of gender-based violence. You can't talk about trafficking and, talk, and not talk about land rights. The companies that are basically uh, working on plantations and everything, where did they get that land from? Who's losing that land? Why are they losing that land? So you can't talk about trafficking and not talk about land rights. You can't talk about trafficking and not talk about, as you said, not talk about money. Where's the money going? Where are the banks? Who's holding on that money? How is that money flowing within the market? You can't talk about trafficking and not talk about obvious inequality like in the system. So the truth is, if we are to deal, and that's the reason why trafficking is so hard, it's so complex, is that it's connected to so many other issues. And even on the ground, if I, when I work with a survivor, I will have to think about if a woman who's lost her land because basically the family of their husband thought she wasn't good enough to inherit land. I'll have to think about the fact that she has five children and we live in a, probably she lives in a country that doesn't offer social protection. So she doesn't have health care. So I would have to fix that. So it's looking at the whole, the broad picture. And the broad picture includes all of us. So I really appreciate, Sophie, how you're bringing in that intersectional analysis. Um, and, and giving life to the data. Uh, I once worked with a young woman who um, was being sexually exploited and trafficked, but her family had come from Bangladesh to Canada because of climate change, and then was being pushed into a forced marriage. Um, and you could see how that structural poverty, the migration, um, falling through the cracks of the Canadian system and, and, and the immigration system, how all of those layers Added, um, added on to what ended up to be just the gross human rights violations. Um, Dr. Nida Shah La, um, you've had uh, an impressive career as a lawyer and as an activist and a law professor. Um, and you've also worked as a prosecutor. So it was very interesting for me uh, when we were chatting earlier that you have also taken initiative on your own through the Global Shapers Program to actually create a hub and actually look at some of the prevention pieces and education and life skills uh, around uh, supporting prevention work in, in your country. Tell us a little bit more. Thanks, Maya. Just one small clarification. Oh, I'm sorry. Not Please. a professor, lecture. Still, oh, lecture. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I apologize. Yeah, I way up the career. We academics. Uh, yeah. oh. Maya, I'm very optimistic today, I have to say, because I didn't expect that at Davos, we'd, on a topic on ending uh, mm -hmm. modern slavery, we'd have an audience which actually consists, I'd say, 75% of youth this is amazing. This means that you actually care. I can tell because I was actually, I'm, my background is a bit, I'm from, I was born in Pristina. And you know Pristina and Kosovo, most certainly you've heard about the war in the Balkans. So when I was 10, uh, my family was forcefully deported from the country. And I grew up in Tirana. Uh, I've had the chance actually to study in good universities, to get a good education, 
to work internationally, to work in international organizations. But I felt the necessity to go back to my country and to see if I can actually change things or improve something. So you've heard most certainly about the, the network of the Global Shapers. And the Global Shapers is actually youth who wants, who is actively engaged to uh, promote positive things or to address pressing issues in, in our community, in, their, in, in whichever communities they live. So I returned back to uh, Tirana as an advisor to the Minister of Interior. I worked there for a year and noticed the huge problems of youth in, in, in the country. I mean, it's not Albania, it's not just Kosovo, it's Western Balkans in general. So if, you, if one looks at the statistics, there's around roughly 50% of the population is actually youth. Mm. However, around 25% of youth uh, is inactive. So it's out of the education system, out of the employment system, out of, it's like out of the, it's out of the specter of the data as well. Huh? Uh, so uh, what I felt that it, I mean, modern slavery, we should, I, I think that what we need to look at when we talk about modern slavery is actually to go to the root causes mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. And if we see the root causes, I mean, modern slavery breeds on poverty, breeds on discrimination, breeds on uh, persons without possibilities actually for, for, for uh, to, to, to be part, to be active citizens or to be part of the society. So that's why I actually even, that, that's one of the reasons why I, I decided to found the Global Shapers community in Tirana and bring together young uh, Albanians who were interested in discussion, in discussing these hard topics, because this is not a simple topic. This is not something that can be solved very easily, just like, just like issues of unemployment, just like issues of uh, poverty, just all like issues of inclusion and equality, which for which we've been talking a lot over these days uh, uh, here. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Cocaine mentioned statistics about uh, slaves in the UK. Uh, just a couple of years ago, the highest, like the, in the data of the slaves, one of the highest numbers in terms of the nationalities of persons being prone to, falling prone to modern slavery were actually Albanians. Uh, it's something that touches me, so that's why, and it touches our community as well. And we very much, and I believe that it's very much linked to, uh, to, to, to the main major problem of human trafficking that we have as a region, I'd say, not only Albania. So that's why uh, a way how, I, I, I found a way to, <coughs> To, to, to address the issue of trafficking, of modern slavery, especially in terms of uh, Albania, by, uh, by, talking, by talking to young people, by uh, trying to reform the education system in our country, by uh, understanding what are the, 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 the global movements, what, are, what is happening at a global level. We talked about, I mean, here at Davos, we, we've been talking about reskilling and upskilling and the, necessi and the necessity to be, uh, to be on top when it comes also with developments that technology is bringing. So uh, what I've been basically doing this last couple of months, we've been actually holding uh, trainings and holding discussions uh, with kids in in mm. schools, and we still we don't have statistic data. We don't know exactly how much we are really mm -hmm. affecting, or how much. But I believe that starting from the bottom and working at the community level by raising awareness, by uh, increasing visibility about the phenomenon just by talking about it, 
uh, and by giving skills which maybe will be helpful to, to, to young people to get into the workforce can be actually a way to, to play a role in, in, uh, in, in tackling such a huge problem. It's, it's really incredible how we're seeing the uses of uh, AI and satellite technology, survivor-led activism, you're using community development, you know, as a strategy. All of these strategies peeling back some of the layers of, of what's a really complex issue. Um, I wanted to, mo to move to Sir Robert Wainwright. Um, he comes to us as a partner of the firm Deloitte, but also has had a long career in law enforcement through Europol. What were some of the challenges that you saw? I think as, as a general public, as a, as a layperson, we tend to think of these issues uh, whether it's trafficking or exploitation through, you know, films like Taken or, or, or whatnot. Uh, what were some of the challenges that you saw on the ground and needed policies and, and interventions? I think the, the, the dimension that I, I saw through most part of my career was how organized crime is really cashed in on this trade and has become, of course, a major feature of, of the problem. The growth of sophisticated organized crime syndicates across the globe <coughs> in the way that they have professionalized the business of exploiting men, women, and children, either for sexual exploitation or labor exploitation. It's become big business. You know, you hear the numbers um, um, today, and, and what's driving that in the main is, is greed, greed from criminals um, that, that have made this a global business. And, you know, so when I, when I worked at Europol, where I was... Uh, the boss for, for nine years, you know, our job was really to try and mobilize the European law enforcement community in different areas. We were also active in fighting terrorism, cybercrime, and so on. In this area, one of the dimensions that I noticed was it wasn't already an established priority. Um, it's not automatically a priority for governments or law enforcement. It's interesting, unlike terrorism or cybercrime, for example. And it's interesting because I've, worked in, I've looked at the dimension of modern slavery in, in different ways, from, from my work in law enforcement principally, but also in wider government. I worked with Theresa May when she was UK Prime Minister, as a member of her Modern Slavery Task Force. Um, <clears throat> now as a Deloitte partner, you know, working every day with the executives and boards of global business to try and encourage them and help them move to a more responsible business agenda across many different areas, but also in, in this area, we talk about integrity of supply chains, for example. Um, and also my, my work with the Global Fund to End Modern Slavery, where um, we're trying to raise globally $1.5 billion um, so that we can put it to the kind of initiatives that we need in the parts of the world that you've been hearing about from James and, and, and others. Now, I mentioned that sort of those different viewpoints, because there is one com commonality, and I go back to this point about it's not an automatic priority, that, that in, in each of those areas, the political domain, the business domain, um, the law enforcement domain, you know, we have to work hard as a community to get this onto the, onto the front page of their priorities. They have many other things to do as well. And that doesn't happen. Actually, data helps us to, to sell the case, like James says, uh, the powerful stories that Sophie was, was talking and many others, how they speak about, about it. Um, you know, and, and when you hear about Nita's story, you know, th these are emotive stories that should mobilize anyone. But actually, in the end, what makes the difference, like in every other walk of life, is leadership, is where or not there are the people in positions of, of influence and authority that will stand up and be counted and change something, do something about this. And you know, we had a Modern Slavery Act in the UK, which is imperfect, but it's actually pretty good and has become a, a best practice model around the world, principally because at that time we had a UK Prime Minister who was personally committed to this goal. You have some business leaders, I won't name them, um, who are personally concerned and taking a stand and doing something to, to um, clean up the supply chains, for example, and you have mm -hmm. some law enforcement mm -hmm. chiefs as well. But they're few and far between, and it doesn't happen without that leadership commitment. And so as a community, we've got to mobilize and help these leaders to stand up and, and, and be the ones that, that, that will change this forever and, and reach the goal that James is talking about that we so desperately need to get to by 2030. So when you were talking about that it hasn't been a priority, um, that really struck me because I would think we have as, as a global planet um, consensus around some basic 
ethics and morals, and one of that being that slavery is bad um, and, and that we should be doing something about it. So just a question that I'd like to throw open to the whole panel. What do you think is behind that lack of commitment? Is it a lack of political will? Is it lack of resources? What are your thoughts? Should I jump in? Please. Yeah. Well, I think, I think it's partly about emotional distance mm -hmm. that we don't you know, we, we look at that map and we think, oh, the problem's in Africa or Southeast Asia. Over there. But it's not, actually, because, number one, there's modern slavery in every country on Earth. Uh, that's what the evidence tells us. Num number two, the problems that we were just talking about in those countries are feeding our pets, are feeding our supply chains, are feeding the criminal organisations that traffic people from these other countries, from Eastern Europe for exploitation in our own countries. But we've created an ecosystem, as Sophie so eloquently explained, that allows us to keep our emotional distance. It's partly because of the way the supply chain is organized. It's broken up mm. so that the lead firms, the Walmarts, and I, I don't want to single out Walmart, but anybody who's a lead firm at the top of the supply chain doesn't have necessarily direct legal responsibility or command and control over the person at the bottom of the supply chain. But equally as the consumer, we feel a great emotional distance. And I, I think that Rob's point about leadership is really crucial here. But we, we have to work to influence our authorized leaders, but anybody can be a leader. I was struck a couple of days ago, I was talking to somebody in the Congress Center about the similarity between the climate debate and what we want to happen on modern slavery. And that person said to me, I wish we had a Greta, a Greta Thunberg, who is such a powerful communicator, so disciplined and on message. And it struck me that we do. We do have the Gretas in this field. It's people like Sophie and others who are communicating powerfully and eloquently about this. So why are they not getting the, the airtime that someone like mm -hmm. Greta gets. It's partly, frankly, because the media organizations, and there are exceptions like CNN with its Freedom Project, mm -hmm. haven't mm -hmm. taken an interest, don't see a demand for these kinds of stories. But it's also partly because all of us as consumers of those stories are not asking for more stories and not taking the trouble to go and learn the information as we are now beginning to, frankly, mm -hmm. on climate. So. I think we all have a role to play here in that leadership. You don't have to have authority to be a leader, and Greta certainly is a paramount example of that. What she's achieved in such a short time in communicating the importance of this issue is really staggering. Uh, maybe there's a Greta, apart from Sophie, sitting in the audience or watching uh, today. But I would really encourage you after this panel, don't just go away and shake your head and maybe look ruefully at your pet food tonight. <laughs> Take the power in your own hands, learn more about the issue, and think about how you can start advocating in the school for, for slavery-free supply chains mm -hmm. with your bank. Is your bank really sure that it's not banking these criminal organizations that Rob mentioned? With your pension fund, I mentioned, are they investing in firms that have slavery-free supply chain? We all have leadership potential. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think, again, as we've said, this is, sometimes I feel like this is not a priority because when we go, especially when we go out to communities and we start discussing trafficking, and people start thinking about how big of a problem it is and how overwhelming it can become when you think that. And for me, when I started think, when I think about trafficking and I think about not just trafficking, but going back to also the history of slavery itself. Because I think sometimes it's easy to talk about trafficking and forget about the fact that the term, we are using the term trafficking is because slavery did exist in the first place. So there's this, as you are saying, there's this 
idea of this being such a huge problem so that it becomes quite overwhelming for people to be able to dissect and ask, oh, what can I do as a person and what is my responsibility as an individual? And I think that for us who are advocates and people working in this field is something we need to work on in terms of how do we communicate this huge problem in a way that people understand and can actually be able to pick out the, the things that they can be able to do. In terms of do we need a greater, um, uh, to be honest, I'm an advocate for this issue. One of the things I hate about the development world and how we've basically built, again, a system is this idea that we need to have heroes mm. or we need to have tokens for people to actually listen especially when it's an issue that involves all of us. Because the truth is, survivors and advocates and people who go through terrible things, people like us who've gone through trauma, basically constantly have to educate, constantly have to teach people. And it's exhausting, to be honest. It's extremely exhausting mm. for victims and survivors of trafficking to honestly do this work because you constantly have to listen to stories that remind you of things that you didn't want to. I don't believe in tokenism. I think it's wrong to, I think it, it doesn't help anybody because we build a single narrative around an issue. We build a single narrative about what is supposed to be. And my problem is that single narratives don't help us. They don't address the issue. We need to understand that it's a complex issue. We need to see different people speaking about it. And Greta is amazing. And I'm so glad that one of the things that she's actually also done is highlight some of the different people who were talking about climate change way before Greta. Mm -hmm. yes. And the truth is we built a system that also erases the work of activists that have done this work over the years. When it comes to trafficking, there are so many people that have been talking about this issue over and over again. So also, let's ask ourselves, whose stories do we want to hear? Why do we want to hear stories from certain people and not from certain people? Why is the story appealing to you and uh, when somebody else says it and not appealing to you when another person says it? So for me, for the media, it's more of we don't need a single narrative. We need multiple narratives about this issue because the world is made up of multiple people with multiple identities. It's complex. Let's not be afraid of the complexity. Let's move ahead because it's possible to find out what your personal responsibility is and actually do something. It can be overwhelming, so let's not be afraid of how overwhelming it is, but let's understand that there's simple things. Like right now, just tweeting or writing a message about trafficking won't cost you anything but it could help someone. Being more keen the next time you travel, so the next time you're at an airport and looking around you, just lifting your head and actually looking at the people traveling, traveling with you <coughs> won't cost you anything. Donating to an organization that deals with trafficking, maybe even just when you think about something like $5 or $2, <coughs> It's not much, but it's a lot when you think about it in the context of what work is going to be done. So it's, it's simple. We also need to understand that because we need heroes, we've put such a high price in solving the problem. Because you think that your everyday actions are not heroic, so you don't want to right. do something. So for me, we, if we build a system where we constantly expect heroes to come and rescue us mm -hmm. or heroes to come and fix the problem, what we're essentially also be building is a case for bad situations that require heroes. So we need to stop that. You can be, as you've said, James, anybody here can be a hero and it doesn't take a lot. It's really very simple and very easy to fix it. So James and Sophie, you're talking about sort of taking what can be a very overwhelming topic or set of statistics and actually breaking it down into actionable pieces, whether it's sending out that tweet or 
self-educating yourself, um, donating money to, to NGOs. Anybody on the panel, uh, what are some solutions or concrete steps that you're seeing in your day-to-day -day work? We have a lot of people watching on the live stream, uh, wonderful people who are also in the overflow room next door, the audience here. Um, many people came here today on this sunny afternoon. You could have done anything else. You're busy people. You chose to come to this panel um, so that we can all figure out solutions. What, what are the panel's thoughts? I think if we look at how many times the word modern slavery came up in English-speaking papers online in 2005, mm. it appears that it was mentioned only 41 times throughout the whole really? year. Yes. 41 in 2016, online? yes, wow. it had received more than 6,000 mentions, so it came up in the... So I think that we're, there has been increased interest on the topic. Uh, it needs more visibility, it does, and I think it definitely, and connecting it to concrete histories, to, to, to your work, the work that you do, the stories that you told at the beginning, like the, it kind of, relating it to, ex, to, 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 to specific cases makes it even more uh, tangible for people to actually understand to understand it better. I think in terms, of, you've seen also that in the business sphere, I have the impression that there still has, I mean, some steps have been taken in a way. Uh, there, are, there are brands now that in their products, it's mentioned that there's no forced labor involved. So they have the, hmm. the tech and that kind of might, it still is <clears throat> something. I mean, it won't, it doesn't solve the whole issue. But I think the more we talk about it, the more panels we have about this topic, the, the, the easier it will come or the more it will, it will increase visibility, it will increase awareness, it will incite young people to discuss about it and uh, maybe seek from their constituents about steps to be taken. It will incite in that way government officials to take steps to, 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 to solve the, the issue. So I think it's, it's still, there, there's still, there, there's steps to be taken. Mm -hmm. and, I, agree, uh, I, huh? I agree, Nita, because I, I think there's reason to be optimistic because, listen, the subject is, is clearly powerful enough to incite all of these actors and stakeholders that need to talk about. You can easily see how, in the right circumstances, this can become, you know, another thing as big as climate change and we have you know the young people that are here today that are capable of doing that we have modern social media technology means by which to do it as well you can easily see how this could ignite into a much bigger uh, wider societal concern that matters because it then begins to to drive the the bottom line interests of politicians and business leaders because people are voters voters elect politicians people are also consumers of products uh, and we're already seeing the results of some of that. We, you know, at Davos this year as well, much more than in many year, any years I can remember, the responsible business agenda is, is, is much higher, whether it's climate or something else, much higher. People are more concerned about things like supply chain. So I think there, is, there are reasons to be optimistic. And then when you dig into the possibilities that big business have to help on this, of course, they, they are unlimited. You take the finance sector, you asked my specific question, what's working? In the finance sector, banking sector, strong anti-money laundering controls, working in a highly refined way. I think they need you know, some reform, frankly, but still, they, they are powerful regulatorily controlled mechanisms that monitor transactions, banking transactions, looking for signs of Dirty money, essentially, exploitation or, or the, the, the gains of, of criminal, uh, criminal work. Now, these controls, if driven in the right way, and already we're beginning to see it, is a very powerful way to track, of course, the, the, the criminal flows from modern slavery. And so with a small tweak of existing business controls on a global level already in play, you suddenly begin to see quite a big impact in, in what really can work track down and as we do that as I've been doing in a lot of my career once we once you follow the money you find you identify the criminal organizations you hit them where they where, where it hurts the most for them and you start to cripple their business that alone will not end modern slavery but it will go a long way to helping 
And there are many, many other examples like that in business, in government, where that can happen. If, if we could just capitalize on the early signs we're beginning to see that this is starting to take wind and, and mobilize. And I absolutely agree with James and Sophie and others that there are a thousand Gretas here today and, and, and online. Just do something, something that would make a difference. Ignite, ignite the world around, around this issue and that would make a real difference. Yeah, I, I totally agree with, you, with that point, Rob. And I think there are two questions we can ask ourselves that will help stoke that fire. Just as in, in climate, we've begun asking ourselves, number one, what's my carbon footprint? Mm -hmm. And number two, what's mm -hmm. my plan to reduce it? Yeah. And we ask those questions now of business. It's part of a large topic of discussion here at Davos this week. How do we identify a carbon footprint? And then what is the business's plan to reduce that carbon footprint? We need to do the same with slavery footprint. So actually, one practical thing you as an individual can do is visit a website called Slavery Footprint and begin to find out what is your slavery footprint from the way that you yeah. live your life, from mm -hmm. the goods and services that you consume. Now, that's a reasonably blunt tool, you'll see. It'll begin to give you an idea of how to do this. But the more we ask ourselves, what's my footprint, or what's my school's footprint, or what's my uh, bank's footprint, or what is my um, hospital's footprint, the more we ask that question of those organizations, the more they will be forced to start looking for good answers and we will improve our ability to find the problem and to price it in properly into our decision making. Then the second question is to ask those organisations to ask ourselves, what's our plan for a transition? And that's powerful because then we start moving from the individual acts, just as individuals, mm -hmm. to systemic change. If we want to get back to that 10,000 uh, 10, people a day that we're reducing the mm -hmm. number affected by, mm -hmm. we're going to need individual actions but we are going to need systemic change, as, as Rob's pointing to. So I think we have to ask those two questions in tandem, uh, and that's how the fire will start to build. Wonderful. So systemic change, we also talked about we have here thousands of Gretas or thousands of Autumn Pelletiers. Um, and in that light, I actually wanted to move to questions from our audience here today. Um, we have a lot of people and, and what do you see um, as some possible solutions or a question you'd like to direct to one of our panel members here. If you could also introduce your name uh, and which country uh, that you're from. So I apologize for, for pointing. Um, they're in the back, one, two, three, four. So please, sir, in the back, if you'd like to stand and we'll get a mic to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to apologize to the panel if I'm being a disturbance. Uh, my name is Max. I'm 16. I'm from around here, Sonoisa town, just uh, outside of the room of Davos. And my question would be, um, um, sorry, I'm sorry. Take your time. Take your time. <laughs> Have uh, have it, has the panel ever met a person of probably has met uh, people who have been in forced labor or sex trafficking? What, what stories did these people tell to you personally? So the sharing of stories and the importance of, of not having one story. Did anyone want to? You want to start? <laughs> So uh, I'm a, like I I think probably you missed the first part of uh, the introduction. I'm a survivor of child uh, domestic servitude, uh, and I work directly with victims of trafficking. So we I have on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm in conversation with people who've gone through this. Uh, in terms of uh, some of the stories and some of the things that. They've gone, they've gone through, there's a lot of information online, a lot of stories online. There are a lot of survivors of uh, modern slavery that are speaking out. I will direct you to our HATS website. You can also go to Survivor Alliance, which is a great platform where survivors gather and have built a network to actually talk. And most of them are actually in the movement, doing a lot of good work. So you can also go and check and look at some of the work that survivors are doing in the movement. 
I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah, my name is. My name is Inge Kleinert. I'm from Germany, and I represent the association Culture for Peace. And I must say, I was very impressed, but also very, very distressed by what I've heard from the panelists have said. And I get very depressed when I read that the WEF has been around for 50 years with the ambition of improving the world. But looking at the state of the world today, it scares me because the gap between rich and poor has widened. Climate disasters are going from bad to worse. And if anything has changed, if there's been any change, it's been for the worse. We're increasingly afraid of war. Don't you agree with me that it is really high time for social movements, the peace movement, the climate activists movement, or the human rights movement? Isn't it time for these movements to link up at global level? If we cannot rely on the richest people in the world to do anything about all this. To take that I'm, I'm happy question. to take a stab. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, ma'am, thank you very much for this, uh, this excellent question. Um, I think it's important that we reflect on the challenges that we confront. You uh, explained them very clearly. But it's also important that we reflect on what we've achieved as, a, as society globally in recent years. We're, we're all very, very lucky to be alive today, notwithstanding the difficult experiences that, that some of us may have been through. Our life expectancies are the best that they've ever been in history. Conflict until recently was much less likely to happen than ever before. We've lifted billions with a B of people out of poverty, particularly in China in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, we, we have terrible problems of income inequality, of gender violence, of structural discrimination, but things in, are in many instances trending overall in a positive direction. So I don't disagree with you. There are tremendous challenges we have to deal with. If we don't deal with modern slavery, with climate, this good news will not continue. But there are reasons to be optimistic. We have learned as a society how to regulate ourselves without going to war. We have learned how to cooperate. We have learned how to recognize that there are other stakeholders than just shareholders, that the planet is a stakeholder in our political and economic systems. We have a youth movement that has sprung up internationally that is saying it's not good enough to ignore the environment. It's not good enough to plan for divestment from fossil fuels by 2050 because then we'll be out of control environmentally. So there's a lot we have to deal with, but I'm actually more glass half full than glass <laughs> half empty. Oh, here, I can give you some more. <laughs> uh, can I just add something on that? I think one of the things that she, you've actually mentioned is the intersectionality of issues, and I didn't mm. want that to be missed out, that it's important for us to see how all this movement connects. And I'll say that, for me, one of the issues that have constantly spoken about is the idea that, especially for our movement, we've for the longest time worked in a silo and movements are working in silos and it's important for us to come together and actually recognize that all oppression is connected. All forms of violence, abuse are connected and they come from one face and you've 
mention that, and I think that is extremely important in our next m wave of social mm -hmm. movement and mm -hmm. social change, that we all come together and recognize that if one person is not OK, then all of us shouldn't be OK. So we should come together and basically put together our voices to address these issues. So I totally agree with you in the idea that there's an intersectionality that has been missed out in the past and that moving on into the future, that is something that we need to work towards. Do we have a question over here? Anita Farney from Switzerland. Luckily, most of us are Swiss, and we have very good access to our politicians on a local, state, or national level. I'd like to ask Mr. Wainwright what three questions we all should ask our politicians. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a good point. The first question, I think, is just to personalize. What do you know about um, the problem of modern slavery in, in the world? And we don't expect every politician to recite the numbers and statistics that James is showing. Mm. But I'd like to know, uh, what do you know? Tell me something, at least. And, and secondly, what do you think that the government, your government, should be doing to, to, to stop it? And thirdly, perhaps most importantly, what leadership role is our Swiss politicians going to take, also by influencing the agenda to future meetings of the World Economic Forum, to go back to the point that um, our friend just made, um, but also Switzerland has an uh, enviable record um, for being, um, you know, a world leader and also a great, a great, a great convener of the international community. So there is something here in Switzerland, something very powerful that could happen at a political level. We have a question in the front row, uh, two in the front row, and then we have two there. So um, I first want to thank you for having the opportunity to listen to you because it's inspiring. Uh, I'm a journalist who has been working on this issue for six years, mm. uh, and my goal is the eradication of slavery, child labor, and exploitation in coffee, tea, and cocoa, mm. because we have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. Why not breakfast? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I think it's I'm going to quote you. <laughs> uh, I'm a former political consultant, and I used to come to Davos uh, working with her for a little country in Asia called India. <laughs> and uh, uh, this uh, country, which I love very much because it gave me a great job and also taught me a lot of things. And one of the things that taught me is that in India, one of the secrets is that there are tens and tens of millions of children working. And some people say 100 million. And so if that number is true, uh, that would mean that the ILO figures are false. Yes. But it looks like true because there are 700 million poor people. And if you understand how child labor works, then you come up with a number around 100 million. But I'm here just to leave a suggestion, because I think our goal here is basically to fix the problem, not only to denounce it, which you know most of us have done it. But basically, the solution is quite simple. Uh, everybody in Switzerland knows what a Ferdin Kinder is. And everybody knows that today it's illegal, but everybody knows that the state was supporting it. Well, I hate to tell you this, but Switzerland knows extremely well uh, that 70% of all coffee is traded through Switzerland. And Switzerland knows very well that there are millions of children tied to the supply chain of coffee. And they also know very well that Reuters reported, uh, only in December, I worked with them on this issue, uh, that there was slavery in the supply chain of Nestlé, Nespresso, and Starbucks. All three are Swiss companies because Starbucks is based in Lausanne, Switzerland. So, and the government didn't do anything about it. Even though it was Reuters, which is a very serious news organization. The Washington Post just reported a few weeks ago that there is more child labor and exploitation in certified cocoa than in non-certified. But when we talk about child labor, uh, we are talking about children, many of them have been bought. They're not paid. They buy them for 250 and 300 uh, dollars, and they keep them for five years, only feed them, a bit like a Ferdin Kinder. And uh, the difference is that they are not Swiss and they will never have rights. And so my request is that we think about a solution, and the solution is 10 cents per cup. Yes, if we added 10 cents per cup of coffee, 10 cents per cup of tea, uh, 10 cents per candy bar, and we could discuss other products, we could actually pay the farmers in Assam, India, Darjeeling, or Cote d'Ivoire, and Ghana, or in Brazil uh, enough uh, so there would not be child labor, there would not be slaves, and we could actually monitor that there wouldn't be no exploitation. 
And so this is all at the reach of the World Economic Forum, uh, because I think the CEO of um, Nestle is here. I actually met with the CEO of Unilever just yesterday. And I'm asking them all very simple issues. Why don't we create a new business model, which is based on rule of law, and that creates a transparent shared value system that brings 10 cents per cup from the consumer to eradicate child labor, slavery, exploitation, and that converts these exploited people in consumers of all these companies in the end. Thank you so much, and sorry I took so long. Thank you. So loving the tax. And then we have a question. Thank you, sir. I, I wanted to respond very briefly, actually also connecting this to the previous question about what can be done in, in Switzerland. Uh, right now, in Switzerland, there's a very important debate coming up on uh, responsible business conduct uh, of foreign operating entities operating in Switzerland. It, it's going on in Parliament. It will be coming up. There may be a referendum. It's a very important moment for political engagement by common citizens and by organisations nationally with exactly this agenda that you've just raised. So thank you for raising it. Yeah, very nice. So we can all do something concrete from, from today, the gentleman in the front. My name is Herman. My name is Hermann. I'm from Heidi's home, where we still have pretty good quality of life. But don't think that everything is gold here either. I'm interested in how mankind functions. I would say that it's human and natural for people to be dissatisfied, even when they're doing well. We've discussed this in Switzerland over and over again. We think that uh, the future must be being better than everybody else, having growth, having better education, always having more, more, more. That's very much human nature. We have not been able to control demographic growth. That's a problem. And in Africa, the main issue in Africa, I think, is corruption. So it's easy for China to in come into Africa because the corruption is such. You've pointed to some possible solutions, and I was very interested to listen to what you've had to say. And I can only say that I hope we'll be able to move forward from here. Thank you. Nice. So the question of good governance. Uh, first of all, I think one of the things I'll say is, again, we need to move away from single narratives. While I agree that corruption is a main issue in Africa, it's not the whole story of Africa. If you look at the issue of corruption in Africa, there is a whole background around corruption, around colonialism, around what is happening. And when you look at the media in Africa, I'll talk about Kenya because I'm also not qualified to talk about Africa in general. I can only speak about my country, Kenya. And when We've even spoken about corruption in Kenya and spoken about some of the systems that are around. The people that benefit from corruption and all the things that are happening, like in my country, is the West. So we, we, you can't separate your, you, we simply can't separate the issue of corruption in Africa as being an Africa problem, and that's oversimplifying it. When all, when all our resources, all the resources in Africa are basically brought because of all these trade policies that are significantly unfair in some ways, when, they're, when the benefit at the end of the day is the West, what is someone supposed to do on the other side? So sometimes I think the overgeneralization of a complex issue to like a single narrative is dangerous while corrupt. All the money that most of the politicians actually steal from our people is kept in foreign accounts. It's not kept within our country, it's kept within it's kept within uh, different accounts in Europe, in other parts of the world where that money can't be touched, where policy basically protects these corrupt leaders. Our, our ministers and our government, 
when they come for when when they're sick the reason why they're not they're not focused on building strong social protection system is because they can easily fly to Switzerland and to Europe and to any other country and get great medical uh, cover. While someone like me who basically wants to travel and talk about human trafficking will be stopped at every single border because I look a certain way. So we can't, again, <laughs> generalize uh, the problems of Africa or the problems of a country like Kenya as corruption because I feel like sometimes we simplify things like some of the issues that uh, Africa faces into these boxes so that we are disconnected from it. I think this panel has been very great at actually showing how all of us are, are connected to the problems that Africa and Asia is facing. And I feel like that needs to be the takeaway, that we've built an ecosystem where each of you is involved in making, each of us is involved in this world that is basically exploiting people. While it manifests in Africa as corruption, as poverty, over here it manifests as demand for things, as demand for a better life, better things. It manifests itself as racism for other people. So we need to see that interconnectedness and move away from othering and basically saying that, you know, if they fix this, then it will be okay. The truth is, even if today, and I, and I, even if today, Kenyans stopped being corrupt, let's say, wishful thinking, they stopped all our political leaders stopped being corrupt. The trade policies, the migration policies, uh, some of the uh, things that basically end end up affecting our livelihoods would still exist, and we would still need to survive. So for me. While corruption is a main issue in Africa, and I agree it, it, it's one of the contributing factors, corrupt, corruption exists, and data has shown that corruption exists in an, in an environment that actually promotes abuse and ex exists as a result of the fact that there are people with power and they abuse it. And the truth is, at the moment right now, the people who benefit the most from the corruption that happens in Africa and Asia is not really Africans, it is the West. So I think that goes back to our earlier, I think that goes back to our earlier questions around who has power, who doesn't, and who benefits. Certainly the research shows that even with trade policies, even with foreign aid, um, that countries in the global south still um, send more resources go back to the West, and that, for example, me as a Canadian, I benefit from the fact that, for example, mining companies um, are not following environmental regulations in, in Colombia. Um, I know, for example, many continental uh, African countries still pay a colonial tax to, to the country of France, and all of that has an impact economically. James, you wanted to comment, and then we have our last two questions here in, in uh, the back. Yeah, I, I want to build on what you've just said, Maya, and this last question. You know, there was a premise in the question, I think, if I understood correctly, sir, that we are going to continue to assume uh, economic growth and the linear progress that we've become accustomed to in the West. And I think that we're at a powerful and important moment of reflection here at Davos this week in asking ourselves, do we want to continue living in the world that way. It goes back to the point Sophie made earlier that we actually are recognizing now that we've achieved the system we have with ostensible wealth in Western Europe, for example, at a cost, at a cost to the environment that is coming back to bite us, at a cost to other people. And I think we're looking now, the, the question of modern slavery is, and is a larger reflection uh, on this question of are we going to take responsibility for those costs in their true, uh, in a truly comprehensive way? Are we going to price that in to the way we do business and the way we live? And maybe that means that we don't assume ongoing economic growth at, the, at this expense, that we actually look for a different model that's not necessarily about pure economic progress, but is actually about progress of a different kind. Uh, that's about progress in the way we live with each other, uh, in the 
sustainability of ecosystems and the services they provide us. Even like a country like Bhutan measures gross national happiness because they recognize that economic growth is not the only or necessarily the best path to well-being. But I think there's a fundamental question for us to ask here about how we want to be and organize ourselves in the world. Wouldn't that be amazing if, if we looked at gross national happiness the way we, <laughs> we hear about the, the gross domestic product yes. in, in the news and how we follow the st stock market? Uh, the two women who've been patiently waiting. Yes. Thank you. Jeanette Bergen, I'm from Norway. And uh, our uh, sovereign wealth fund was mentioned, uh, uh, which is one of the biggest uh, funds of the world. Um, and there is one important point uh, and one important reason why it's one of the funds of the world that has the best, best ethics. And uh, that is transparency. Transparency about where sovereign wealth funds, where pension funds, where banks are invested is crucial to solve uh, the problems of the world and the challenges. Information empower people and empowers uh, society and it creates competence. That's why Norway is uh, very at the forefront of uh, responsible business conduct and responsible investments. I represent a pension fund. We have excluded companies Ulam and POSCO because they buy cotton from Uzbekistan. We have excluded G4S from our investments because they are engaged in uh, slavery and business in, the, um, um, in Qatar and other countries. So I want uh, to uh, encourage uh, you know, all the people here and you on the panel as well to um, you know, raise the hand for transparency because that's what empowers people. Thank you. Um, a colleague of Jeanette, um, I have a question to you, uh, Dr. Kukain. Where, where would you say is the improving potential for the multinational companies? Even if you know all of them have committed to the SDGs, and suddenly everybody is talking about that there are business opportunities in responsible business conduct, but still, you know, the implementation is quite far away from the commitments on the paper. I'm afraid I missed a word. Where is the what opportunity? Where uh, is the improving potential for the multinational companies when it comes to modern slavery? Well, well I think uh, actually in a sense your colleague answered the question. <laughs> you know, I go back to what I said earlier that the first question we have to ask ourselves is what is my slavery footprint? And that's a question that many businesses are being required now to ask in some jurisdictions. There's disclosure legislation in place in the UK, in Australia, in Canada, to some extent in France. It's part of what's being discussed here in the Swiss Parliament. If we require, whether as shareholders or as government regulators, companies to ask, what is my footprint? That brings us to the whole question of transparency and empowering people who control the businesses to take the steps to, to address them. I just want to applaud uh, the work of your pension fund to, yeah. to focus on this issue. Um, and for anyone else in the audience watching or here who's in that sector, there are ideas and examples of this kind of good practice at fastinitiative.org, Finance Against Slavery and Trafficking. Uh, it includes actually an interactive tool for allowing you to ask exactly that question. What's my risk exposure? What's my slavery footprint? as an organization. I think that's the first, understanding the answer to that question is the first step to doing something about it. Uh, I think the other thing is uh, this particular issue falls under SDG 8.7. And I would like to say that unfortunately, it's the only SDG that doesn't have indicators. So mm -hmm. I know that one of the things that our young people and people are basically have really rallied around is the sustainable development goals. And one of the ways that you could actually also contribute is actually going to uh, what is this, start advocating for indicators indicators for SDG 8.7. I know Work Free Foundation is actually working with governments to try and see if they can develop some indicators for that particular SDG to help us track progress so that we can be able to hold ourselves accountable. 
Wonderful. So asking, you know, we talked earlier about asking some tough questions of our politicians, of our Swiss politicians, also of our banks. Uh, residents of Davos, if you see in the next few days a CEO or a banker or a politician sort of stumbling around lost, you can, as you guide them, you can <laughs> ask, ask some tough questions. We're going to do a quick lightning round, uh, starting with uh, Sir Wainwright and then working our way up. Uh, just in, in one sentence, um, if, if there's one takeaway you want uh, for, for this audience and the live stream to take away today, in one sentence, what would that be? I'd mobilize the community as a whole. Public-private partnerships are a great way to tackle the problem. And um, this is a long sentence. And <laughs> going back to the first one, of the first points that James started with, data is so important. Um, if, we can, if we can use data to learn much more about the problem, that becomes the oil in the engine of connecting different communities as well. There's a great initiative in the UK by Stop the Traffic, uh, so-called TA up there. They're starting to assemble data from lots of different actors in this space, beginning to see a real sense of the problem. When you see a wider sense of the problem, it, draw, it can identify priorities and then give, give, you, give you some hooks by which a public-private partnership community can really get into this. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd, I'd agree with, uh, with uh, I, I, my comment would be along the same lines. And um, in my opinion, it's, uh, it's important to, to bring visibility and to kind of, the more we talk about the issue, the more important it will be, the more awareness it will raise, the more it, w the more it will affect uh, the, the, the leadership to do something. And uh, so basically, it's all, it all starts by understanding the problem and recognizing that this is a, a, a serious issue that it is necessary to, to address. And, uh, and once, we, once we get, I mean, once we, we uh, bring it, we, we, we raise it up and include it in the agenda, uh, then there may be other initiatives that will follow up actually in terms of providing a solution to, to one of the things. Thank you. Uh, I think basically one of the things that has consistently come up in the, in the panel has been the fact that we are all connected. And I know especially when we are in a forum like this where it's, we are constantly, as we've said, James said, we are constantly talking about economics, economics, and we are constantly talking about money. I think for me it's understanding that we are all connected and the money and the data and all these things basically represents people. And at the end of the day, we want to build a world where people thrive. They don't necessarily survive, they actually thrive. And we sort of have to ask ourselves what that looks like for all of us. I think we haven't really been great at doing that because essentially we've left other people to pay the cost of all of us thriving. And I hope that we can be more conscious in ensuring that all of us thrive. Because when one person hurts, all of us hurt, even if you are not feeling it right now as we've seen with climate change, eventually it will come on your door. So let's fix it right now. It's very hard to say anything after that, but <laughs> I drop. think that the key thing that Sophie points to is empathy. All of you have exercised a little leadership, a little moral imagination by choosing to come and be here or to watch this. And if there's one thing I could ask you to do when you leave, it's simply to keep caring Keep thinking about the people that we've been talking about today. It doesn't cost you anything to care. It doesn't yeah. cost you anything to act in your daily life from that place of care. And you know what? You might actually find that it makes you feel a lot better about the world. Mm -hmm. So, We've talked about in the past hour and a half, we've talked about how we're all connected, how it's important to care, how small actions, tiny, tiny interventions, because all of these issues are connected, can actually make a real difference. So in our last 90 seconds, we're actually going to do some collective impact of our own. So I'd like everybody to stand. And I promise this is very easy, no math this time. Individual actions can actually create noise, can create a thunderstorm, and have real impact. 
So I would like for all of you, um, if you can just put out your hands and simply follow me as I move up and down the aisle slowly, but for now, just do this. you have made a thunderstorm. So each one of our tiny, tiny actions actually can create an impact. I'd like to thank my panelists this afternoon and thank you to everybody who came out and to everybody who watched at home. Thank you. Thank you.